welcome. Uh, I'm Pastor Bill Evans, Chetwin Fellowship Baptist Church, and uh, glad to be part of the Chetwin uh, ministerial uh, taking the message on the airs waves. Um, I'm blessed and uh, being able to be part of this program to help out and uh, glad to just know and and as uh, we, we say, uh, Leo used to say, this stuff goes all over the world. Uh, so wherever you are in the world listening in, um, welcome and may God bless each heart and each home represented today. Um, I want to go to a, a, a story that uh, some people know. There was a man and his name was Job. And we talk about the patience of Job and uh, the patient endurance of this man, Job. And uh, it's a wonderful start off to the book that's written about him. And it says in verse 1, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless. And that man was upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. And I love what the King James Version reads. He eschewed evil. He eschewed evil like you, like you got a mouthful of chewing tobacco and you spit it out after you chewed it up. And he eschewed evil. And uh, he, he just turned away from it and would have nothing to do with it. We're told that he was blessed with seven sons and he had three daughters were born to him. He had 7,000 sheep and a whole bunch of animals. And back in the day, they didn't have the Scotia Bank, the TD Bank, and all those other guys. They owe me for a commercial. Um, they didn't have those things. You were known by how much wealth you had, and your wealth was in your possessions that you had. Uh, vernacular of the world today says what? It says, whoever has the most toys when he dies wins. And that's not the truth. But here, he had all these possessions. And one day, the story relates that how God... Uh, uh, some of his, uh, it says the sons of men came along, or the sons of God came along, and, 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 and Satan came along with them. And uh, they got talking. And uh, Satan was asked, what are you doing? Oh, just going and wandering around the world and roaming around and seeing what kind of trouble I can cause, almost. The Lord said to him, hey, have you considered my servant Job and uh, my servant? And for there's none like him on all the earth. And Satan says, well, do you think Job fears God for nothing? He only fears you because you give him, you've hedged him in with blessings and good things. And that's why Job serves you. You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he'll curse you to your face. Here's puny little Satan shaking his little face, a fist in the, in the face of the eternal God. And if you touch Job's stuff, he'll curse you to your face. So the Lord said, Here's the deal. All that he has is in your power. Only don't touch him. So Satan departed. The story goes on from there that uh, Satan was able to go and, and he attacks Job and he kills off all of his kids. And he takes away all of his possessions. And Job's got nothing. And he's driven to these words. Job arose and tore his robe and he shaved his head and he fell to the ground and he worshipped and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. And then he says, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then this, through all this, Job did not sin nor blame God. He did not sin nor did he blame God. He lost his health when Satan came back then because Satan comes to the Lord, skin for skin, God will give everything you got just to be healthy and not have pain. The Lord says, okay, do what you want, but you can't kill him. So Job loses all of his health that he has and Satan and went out there and beat up and he lost all that. And he's in trouble and he's got a piece of pottery and he's scraping boils and stuff like that just to help break some of the uh, festering sores that he's got. And then this thing happens in the midst of all of his struggles. His wife says to him, honey, why don't you just curse God and die? Why not just curse God and die? But he said to her, you speak as a foolish person speaks. Can't we accept good from God and then think that we should not have adversity? In all this, Job didn't sin with his lips. Job then had three friends. The rest of the story goes on. If you don't know the story, you can read it in the book of Job just before the book of Psalms. And he tells you about three men that showed up. And they were friends of his. And if you've got friends like Job's three friends, you don't need enemies. Because they challenged Job. Job, you know, you're a really good guy. But what, what has happened? We know you're a good guy. We believe you're a good guy. The world believes you're a good guy. But God knows you've got some issues. And so, uh, you know, whoever perished for being innocent. 
And he says that in verse 7 of chapter 4, he says, so where were the, uh, where, where were the upright destroyed? Job. And the challenge is, you got issues, and we'd like you to fess up. And so the story carries on, and all the way up to chapter 13, uh, there's things that are happening there. And, uh, and in chapter 13, verse 15, Job's arguing, Job's arguing with them. And he says, guys, I need you to know one thing, that even if God kills me, I am going to trust him. I'm going to hope in him. He's going to be my confidence, even though he kill me. That's where I'm going to stand. That's the man, Job. Could you say that with your relationship with God? Even though he kill you, you'll trust him, you'll hope in him. Is that a reality or just something for an old patriarch of the Old Testament? Well, in the New Testament, not New Testament, and further on, later on, in the land of Israel, there was judgment of God came upon Israel and they were taken off the land of, Nebuch of uh, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And this man, Nebuchadnezzar, had three little Israeli boys uh, made into uh, eunuchs in his uh, kingdom and uh, service. And, and, and he had them, and they were doing quite well. He quite liked them. But he set up a, a big monument, and he says, I'm going to play music. When you hear the music, everybody falls down and worships my idol. And so they seemingly did that one day, and he's, Nebuchadnezzar is looking out. What is that? And his binoculars, he's looking. And there, who's those three guys standing up out there? Who are those? Go out and find out. They find out Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Guys, they need you to bow down when you hear the music. I like you guys. You've got to bow down when you, hear the, when you hear the music. And in chapter 3 of Daniel, it says, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from uh, the furnace of the fire, uh, blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king, we believe. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image you've set up. Though you slay me, I'm still going to trust him. The story is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in a furnace that was heated up much more than it was before. And as they were throwing the men in there, whatever, the men that threw them in burned up. The heat was so bad, but they went down. And as they're there, must have been a little window in that furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar looks in, and he sees that these uh, three men are in there, and someone else is with them. He goes, looks like the Son of God. Looks like the Son of God. Didn't we throw three guys in? Yes, how come there's four? Though you slay me, yet I'll trust you. Shadrach, Meshach come out of the fire, and we're told that the smell of smoke wasn't even on them. The smell of smoke wasn't on their clothes. We have California fires bringing smoke up this way. No smell of smoke on their clothes. In the New Testament, Acts chapter 7, there's a man named Stephen, preacher of righteousness. And he's challenging the Israeli leadership in the Jewish church, Jewish people, that they were in trouble before God. And because of that, the Jewish people got mad at him. And they were cut to the heart. And they take him out of the city and they're going to have him stoned to death. And they're stoning him. And while they're stoning him, he says, Behold, and you're being killed and people throwing rocks at you for they don't like what you're doing, what you're saying. He says, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they just covered their ears more and started throwing more rocks at him. And they killed him. They laid their clothes down at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, went on stoning Stephen who called on the name of the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then falling on his knees, he cried with a loud voice, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. If in our Christian life we can die, if we can say, God, though you slay me, I'll trust you. What if he puts you to the test? Where are you at? Shadrach, Meshach, in the fiery furnace, maybe on the way in? I don't know. Can you really mean when you say, even though you slay me, I'll trust you? See, Stephen was pushed to that point. And he not only said, even though you slay me, yet will I trust you. He said, Jesus, do not hold this sin against them just like Jesus. That's how God would like us to be. What's your faith like in this day, COVID and all those things going on? Are you able to say, though you slay me, God, I'm going to trust you. Because what Jesus has done is so important to me. My sins are forgiven, cleansed, made a child of God through faith in his name. Even though I slay you, you trust, uh, even though you slay me, I'm planning to trust you. God grant me grace that I might do that.
Amen. May your heart be blessed. <clears throat>
who couldn't even give one man the courage to fight a giant in his name. The problem was the Israelites believed in God, they just didn't believe him when God worked outside of what made sense to them. It's kind of like they owned skis, but at home they would wear them around the house, maybe around the yard, but when they got to the slopes, they didn't trust them to do their job, so they'd take the chairlift up and then carefully walk back down to the bottom of the mountain. Now maybe they were waiting for God to hit Goliath with lightning, or maybe they thought the ground would open up and swallow him whole. Uh, maybe they were waiting for their own king, King Saul, who was their own giant. Uh, the Bible says he was a head taller than anybody else in the nation to take up his sword and fight Goliath. See, it's easy to believe in something, to support somebody when you yourself don't have to do or trust anything. It gets more challenging when suddenly you are called to act. It, it's like repelling off a rock face. You see others do it and they seem fine. You watch the knots get tied and they seem good. Uh, you believe the rope is going to keep you from falling, but as you back over the edge and are about to take that one step uh, where you're no longer on solid ground, where you are 100% supported by that rope, you start to get nervous. When you're repelling, sometimes people get scared and back out just when they're thinking about it. Sometimes people back out when they're setting the rope up and tying the knots. Some people say nope when they begin backing toward the edge, but most people who get scared and back out do so right before they take that final step of faith over the side. But hardly anybody backs out once they're already hanging over the edge. Because at that point you realize the rope is saving you. Uh, your blood is still pumping with adrenaline, you're still probably scared, but at that point what are you gonna do? Say, rope, I don't believe in you? Cut it and fall to your death? No. It's easy to say that you believe in something if you don't try it. It's hard to believe in something truly until you do. David believed, and while his brothers were off with the army, trying to avoid eye contact with Goliath, David was back home taking care of the sheep. And sheep, much to their disadvantage, are tasty little critters. And being tasty little critters, they have a lot of very big hungry enemies uh, with sharp teeth. And so David, in addition to making sure they had enough food and water and rest, he also had to defend them against their hungry predators. And what he had to defend them with was a shepherd's stick and a sling. And with a shepherd's stick and a sling, the Bible says that he fought off a bear and he fought off a lion, literally rescuing the sheep from their mouths. Now David knew his odds were bad against a bear and a lion, and when he survived, he learned something. David learned that God was with him, and that made all the difference. Now this was a lesson that David never would have learned had he just run away from the bear and the lion and let them munch his entire flock of sheep. So when David's dad asked him to go to the front lines to check on his brothers and take them some food, he was ready. And when he arrived and found all of Israel skulking and looking away while Goliath made fun of them and their God, David didn't hide. He asked the nearest person what was going on and why nobody was fighting this guy. And they told him that everyone was afraid and so David went to find the king. Uh, not because David was a fighting man himself, but because he saw the giant was standing against God, and he knew that God would be with whoever stood up against him. He remembered the lion and the bear from his own experience, from his own life, and that told him that he could absolutely trust in God. And when David finally found King Saul, the king tried to make David wear his royal battle armor to fight the giant, but that wasn't the right equipment. David said, I can't go out in these. He took it off. He went out with his shepherd's stick and his sling, picked up five smooth stones from the creek bed. But the equipment David was relying on, it was not his stick or his sling either. See, David walked out toward the giant. And when Goliath noticed him, he began to laugh. He said, am I a dog that you're coming after me with sticks? Come here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. And David replied, you come against me with a sword and a spear, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty and the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Now, notice he didn't say, you come against me with a sword and a spear, but I come against you with a stick and a sling. The equipment David relied on, the right equipment, was faith in God. 
David believed God and God honored him. See, it turns out that Goliath didn't end up feeding David's flesh to the birds and the animals after all. One rock from the sling and the giant was history. Israel won a huge victory that day and it wasn't because of Saul's special armor. It wasn't because of David's stick or his sling. It was because somebody trusted in God. You can win this victory too. What's your battle? Is it relationships, money, work, broken families, drugs, doubt? If you want to win your battle, you don't need anything more than God. God will turn your sling and your stick into something far more powerful than any sword or spear that comes against you. Just ask him for help. Rely on him. And you'll find that he's already there and he has been all along. Just pray and believe. And if you don't know what to pray, if you don't know how to pray, then just pray this after me right now. Jesus, please help me. Amen. Now you can step out and you can watch your giants fall. For the past 14 years, Chetwin, BC has been giving artists the chance to carve their dreams.
Artists come from all over the world in June and leave us with stunning sculptures. Wood plays a vital role in this town. It's ingrained everywhere you look. I like the hippo, and uh, even though my buddy here uh, carved the moose last year I bought off of him, I still have to go with the hippo this year. What do you like about it? I just like it's different. It's completely different from what we've seen up here. We don't see a lot of that uh, African type things. You know, it's all eagles, bears, and it's all that kind of stuff. So that's just unique this year, so that's why I'm voting for it this year. What are you carving? Uh, yeah, I carved a uh, hippo and a rhino. Why? Uh, my, my son, favorite animal. <laughs> it's an important, almost confession of she changed me. And so he wanted to honor her in a way by having her checkmate and saying, wow, she's exceptional. She's not someone who just messes around in fancy outfits. She's an educated person to be respected. Oh, heck, everybody wants to be in the top three, but just to be here, I'm happy. If I could pull it off and have it look somewhat like a woman, even Gaga, that would be great. As long as it doesn't look like Harmon Munster, I think I've done my job. Oh, no.